when I look at abstracts and when I look at titles, the things I'm looking for are like, is it going to be easy for an attendee to see these and know what they're going to be getting themselves into? What should I have in my mind going into the talk? And what should I be able to walk away with? I've spoken at Cincinnati in the past, a, a user group long ago. And I remember the community there was just very welcoming and very much eager to learn and eager to share with others. I like going to the sessions, but I don't count on the sessions because if they're recorded, I can catch them later. I count on the hallway mm -hmm. track. I count on catching up with people. Hello, my name is Dave Agarwal, and I'm an organizer for Momentum, the annual developer conference that is hosted in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today, to talk about Momentum with us, we have Saduki. How's Hello. it going? It's going great. How are you, Dave? I'm doing great. It's great to have you here. Do you want to give a short introduction? Sure. So my name is Sarah Dukevich, but in the tech community, I go by Saduki. Uh, I'm on all the social media as a Saduki, so that's the best way to find me. Uh, I've been a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies for 15 years now. I've uh, been involved with Momentum. I've been following them for a while. This is, I think, my first year on content review. Uh, and I'm also going to be a speaker this year, too. Let's go. Did you select yourself for the speaker slot? <laughs> no, no. So then this isn't the first time where I've been on content selection for a conference and have also been mm -hmm. selected. But when I do the conference selection, I do conference selection for tracks I don't submit to. Got it. So where did you first hear about Momentum? How did it come across your radar? I blame Michael Richardson. It's all his fault. <laughs> So I've known Michael Richardson for many, many years. We cross paths on social media uh, and we cross paths at the local and regional conferences. So Momentum is down in Cincinnati. I'm up mm -hmm. in Northeast Ohio, closer to between Cleveland and Akron. So Ohio's kind of, we're a close knit community. We talk. And when I heard about Momentum, I was like, well, I should check this out. Sounds amazing. And when was this? That was years ago. That was years okay. ago. But it just hasn't lined up. So October is one of those where once we get into the fall, trying to find conferences that I can speak at and that my husband can go to that don't overlap is a challenge. And so this was one of those times where I'm like, yes, it doesn't overlap with anything. I'm submitting and we'll see how it goes. Amazing. Yeah. So you talked about some more uh, local slash regional conferences. So what mm -hmm. conferences come into this? So for me, I have been involved with Stir Trek since about 2009, and I've okay. been involved with CodeMesh off and on since probably about as long. Nice. And uh, you have you've been involved as in were you speaking, content review, organizing, volunteering? Yes, yes, all of, all of those, all of those. So with Stir Trek, I have been helping with their content selection off and on as they need it. I have helped with trying to review session, like that final schedule to make sure that topics aren't scheduled up against each other. So mm -hmm. I've had to do that. Um, with Stir Trek, I am in charge of about 30 volunteers. So I'm in charge of the volunteers who help run the event behind the scenes to make sure everything moves smoothly. So if you've encountered any of the volunteers there, those are my crew. They're an awesome group uh, from all over. And then with CodeMesh, I have been on speaker selection for a couple years off and on. I have helped with their planning every now and then. And then I have spoken at many CodeMeshes as well. Nice. So you really like conferences, uh, I hear. I, I do like conferences. I tend to stick to the local ones, and I tend to stick to community-run events. OK. Uh, what are their uh, types or kinds of conferences are there so you said the local community uh, local ones and community ones right so the local ones being like my user groups um if the local community is going to organize an event like a give camp for example that, where okay. we donate our time and help nonprofits to get websites or mobile apps or whatever it is that they need um, mm -hmm. i've been involved with those uh, but then community run events so thinking at looking at the larger ones. So CodeMash, looking at StirTrack, looking at Music City Code, which is down in Tennessee. Um, those are where the people who are organizing the event, we're developers, we're software architects, we're business analysts, we are project managers, we have day jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's not as an event organizer, um, but we care about our community so much and we wanna be able to give opportunities for the community to learn more. 
and to share our knowledge with each other and to help, for example, companies who want to sponsor events, it gives them mm -hmm. an audience then to get their name out mm -hmm. to, and then to also get the foot traffic and to talk to the people as well. So those are the right. big things. There are also other events out there, like they're the ones that are sponsored by big product groups. And so then you hear things like, well, Twilio's conferences or Microsoft's conferences, Oracle, Red Hat, you name it, the bigger companies have their own conferences as well. Some of those right. happen to be community run, but some of those are also professional event organizers. Got it. So there's the local ones, there's the community organized event, and there's the corporate event. Yeah, the more corporate -y ones. Got it. And the corporate -y ones, I'm assuming there's like a full team of, uh, I don't know, full time event organizers that take care of all of this. Okay, the, the event organizers, some or the, the community ones, some of us do actually make use of an event organizer. So mm -hmm. with Stir Trek, we do have an event organizer who helps us. Erin is wonderful. She helps us with dealing with the venues and the contracts and all the catering and things like that and getting all the that detail handled. She's awesome at that. So it's, it's great to be able to hand that off. Uh, there's another conference that I helped with this year called MSP GeekCon, which is on the IT Pro side of things. Okay. And it's a, a community run event for people who work for managed service providers. So think of like IT services mm -hmm. for companies who don't want their own IT department. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see them more in like small or medium businesses, but their community did a conference this year and they talked with a bunch of other conference organizers. So we were able to help them get their year one off the ground. Uh, but they right. also work with a professional event organizer who happens to be involved in other conferences in that industry, mm -hmm. which helped make their first year event run a lot smoother. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, definitely uh, the full-time organizers or professional event organizers, they definitely play a big role even in the community. Absolutely. Conferences. Absolutely. Yeah. When, when, when we can see them as a partner and not as a replacement mm -hmm. for all the organizers, it's it's a beautiful team. Yeah. Definitely. So you've been speaking, you've been in content reviews. Uh, how how many conferences have you spoken at? What kind of conferences do you, like, is there a specific category of conferences that you look for? Or, uh, yeah, what's your approach to, like, speaking so, at conferences? So how many have I spoken at? <laughs> that I've lost track of that number. I've been speaking since 2009. Um, and it's been mostly at, at tech conferences. So my mm -hmm. audience, I typically speak in what's known in the old old school terms. We were the Microsoft Heartland District. So it was Ohio and Michigan and Kentucky and Tennessee. That particular region is where I tend to stick around. Um, okay. Uh, now, where I'm at between Cleveland and Akron, I'll go two, two and a half hours and drive for like user groups. Mm -hmm. uh, when we get into conferences, four hours, okay, I can drive six hours. <sighs> now I'm looking like I need to go find a plane because I don't want to drive that long. <laughs> I would rather be able to have that time to, to focus on the content and getting things mm -hmm. ready for the conference. So, right. so I, I have done conferences. I did PyCon in 2009 out in Chicago. Um, that was probably one of my further ones, not counting the MVP summit out in, in Redmond, Washington. Uh, okay. And then I have spoken internationally. My international uh, engagement was in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and it was at a user group there talking about Python for C Sharp developers. Python for C Sharp developers. <laughs> so I'm I have sure a problem. Well. <laughs> I have a problem. I like programming languages. They, they all <laughs> just kind of find me and just glom on to me. So when I can tell developers about other languages in relation mm -hmm. to their own language, it, it's a fun thing for me. That's great to hear because I, I've also been looking at some like uh, newish programming languages recently. And okay. uh, yeah, I would love to chat with you about that more at some sure. point. Oh, absolutely. So um, you were doing the content review for Momentum this year. Yes. And uh, I, I didn't really get to take a look at a lot of the content, even though I had access to Session Eyes, but I've heard a lot of great things from everyone who was looking at the content. So you want to talk about more details there? Sure, sure. Uh, being a content reviewer is tough. <laughs> and the reason why people are like, oh, you just review sessions. It's not that easy. Um, first of all, what my crew did, we were looking at the sessions blindly. 
So mm -hmm. for the most part, we don't know who submitted sessions. I say for the most part because inevitably something will be in a, a abstract and you'll be like, oh, I know who that is. But for the most part, it was you would see names like Amethyst Brown. Oh, okay. I don't know who Amethyst Brown is. I don't need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we would go and we would look and see. Now, the way Sessionize works, there are different ways that we can have our track set up. So I, I, I say we on the Stir Track side, I've actually helped set up the tracks. So I know how that process works. And you can say, okay, if I've got a small track, which we did not have any of those at Momentum, um, but we can we can vote like yeses and nos or star mm -hmm. reviews, like three stars, four stars, five stars, that kind of stuff. But because of the track sizes we're looking at here, I think the smallest track size I saw was 40 something. And then I think the largest track I saw was like a hundred and something. Wow. Yeah, so that's like a lot of talks in a track. Mm -hmm. and. I'm not the only one who reviews the track. I think Kat had at least nine or 10 other people. Mm -hmm. um, but we would all have to go through session eyes and we would have to look at the sessions and it would be side by side by side. So three, three sessions would come up and we'd look and we'd go, okay, well, how do you rank them? Session eyes is one of those that if you don't know what it's doing, you might go, okay, fine. I'm going to rank them one, two, and three and be done. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be like that, though. So they do have one, two, and three for options for all of them. But mm -hmm. if they're all both, like, there have been times where I've looked at some of them, and I'm like, I like this one, and I like this one, and I like this one. And none, <laughs> of, none, none of them are awful. So none of them are, like, a flat-out, no, I don't want them. Right. Like, but I can't mark them all, like, ones, oh, my gosh, yes, we need all of them here. Because if I did that, there would be a lot more ones, <laughs> and we'd make our decision more tougher. So right. those, uh, there are times where you could be like, you know what? these two are twos and this one is a one because this one is clearly better than the others. Or there were times where I'd look at them and I'd be like, that talk is awful. The abstract isn't written clearly. I have no idea mm -hmm. what the, the attendees will get out of this session. So that's an instant three. Okay. But then two and one would be a, a toss up because I'd have to look to see when I look at abstracts and when I look at titles, the things I'm looking for are like, is it going to be easy for an attendee to see these and know what they're going to be getting themselves into? Mm -hmm. What should I understand? What should I have in my mind going into the talk? And what should I be able to walk away with? And to me, that matches up with the one of the topics I deal with, which is user experience. It's going into it and coming out, not just the experience in, in the uh, moment. So that's one of those that I look at it and I'm like, if it's not clear as to what I can gather from it, we have enough selections that I can mark a three and be confident and not regret it. Right. Cool. So that, that was, um, that was about kind of the logistics of like how mm -hmm. you rank the sessions. So you said that the title and the abstract are like definitely very important. We should have, yeah. Uh, like the title should the title should convey the expectations of what the talk are. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, okay. I mean, and, and if the title doesn't give enough, does the abstract leave a clear enough picture? Because sometimes right. people get a little too like catchy with their titles, mm -hmm. or they'll try to put a hook in there and get you laughing, and you're like, "Oh, this is hilarious! This is awesome! I need to see this, but I still have no idea what I'm going to see." Go to the abstract. If that abstract is clear as to what you're going to get there's a better chance that I'll bring it in and be like, yeah. The other thing I look to is, okay, could I tell that chat GPT made an appearance and, <laughs> and it's trying to baffle me with BS that is so, so far not true that I'm just like, okay, get out of here. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. Uh, what, what does the involvement of AI have, like how do, how has that changed your job as a content reviewer? I, I say your job, like it's completely voluntary. <laughs> it, but, is, it is completely yeah. voluntary. But as a reviewer, I am paying even more attention. It's not that I didn't pay attention pre-AI, mm -hmm. but I have, so I use AI as part of my day job as well. And that's just, if I have to create social media content mm -hmm. and I don't know the right way to say something, I'm like, okay, or if I need to convert to VB.net from C Sharp, for example, I'm like, those are cobwebs there. Hey, ChatGPT, mm -hmm. can you help me out? But there are things where it is, it is got the confidence where it's just like, yeah, it's really this thing. And you look at it and you're like, no, not even close. 
this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I have to read carefully and I have to look and see, does this match up and does this make sense? So when I review tracks, I'm reviewing tracks that I'm confident in my understanding. I'm confident in my knowledge. And mm -hmm. it's not like tracks that I'm like, oh, you know, what? I'm hobby interested in this and not mm -hmm. professionally dealing with this stuff. I try to avoid the hobby interests and it's, it's stuff that I am actually caring about and stuff that I'm working with to this day. Right. So that was like AI causing issues with the content review. Oh, Do you think there's, oh, go ahead. I was say it could, it could. Uh, there were a couple where I've seen where they're like, uh, chat GPT generated this title and generated this abstract. And I'm like, why would you even do that? <laughs> because it was explicitly saying something along those lines of have chat GPT generate your talk. And I'm just like, well, I mean, I get it, but, mm -hmm. uh, do you think there are any merits to AI? Do you think it can help uh, not only speakers, like probably not generate their entire talk in abstract, but like help them think, help them uh, augment their own creativity in some way? Oh, absolutely. You know? I think it, I think it could help with getting out the points of a top of a talk and maybe okay. helping with framing a storyline. Uh, so there might be times where you're like, for example, ChatGPT again, just because it's one of the AIs I work with often and say, give me real world examples or give me relatable examples about some technology um, I had. So there's a, a, tech, a software term terminology, clean architecture. Uh, of and course. So, so me being a woman in tech, I always bring quirks to the field. And so I was like, OK, ChatGPT, let's talk. Explain clean architecture to me as if I was L. Woods from Legally Blonde. <laughs> that was hilarious because it compared. It, I gotta try that. <laughs> it compared clean architecture to a rushing a sorority. <laughs> I'm like, oh dear. It wasn't completely off. It was actually pretty spot on. But it's mm -hmm. stuff like that where it's like, okay, uh, so th that was the fun part of it. But then I've been doing things like explain this technology concept to me as mm -hmm. if I were a five-year-old or okay. explain it to me as if I were a mom or, or if I was not in technology or explain it to me as if I was a nurse. So then mm -hmm. it would help me find the relatable examples that I may not necessarily know, like, especially if I do something like explain this technical concept to me as if I were a nurse, I have mm -hmm. no medical training. <laughs> I am not a nurse, um, <laughs> but I can use chat GPT to give me some ideas. Mm -hmm. I use that as ideas, but I don't take them for truth. I use them as research points and go, okay, now right. d d does this sound legit? Okay, it does sound legit. Now let me wrap this into my talk somehow, whatever it may be. Cool. So you heard it here. If you're a conference speaker, use AI to help yourself. <laughs> use it to help, but don't, use a, don't rely on it entirely. Of course. Cool. So um, we are talking about the content review for momentum before this mm -hmm. and uh, beyond just like filtering through uh, let's call it low quality abstracts or low yep. quality proposals uh, once you do get to the point where you are looking at two sessions that are very well put together yeah. how do you decide between the two uh, is that is that where you start thinking of okay what is the vibe of this conference what is the location what is the kind of audience yep. how does that factor so there were many times in the session review process where in the back chat, I would ask Kat. So we had a Slack group. And so in the Slack group as content reviewers, we would ask Kat, hey, how does this conference look at blah? Can we do workshops? Oh, we can't do workshops? OK, well, then if they mention workshops, those are easy to whittle out. OK, then who is your audience? What kind of people do you have? So we as content reviewers will ask those questions so mm -hmm. that we can make sure that we're picking topics that are relatable to the audience. Okay. Uh, we also, uh, content review, be it momentum or otherwise, we always want to choose talks that work well with the audience. And mm -hmm. we want to make sure we have like balances. It's tough because you want balances for like beginners and for advanced folks and mm -hmm. the people in the middle. You want to have all that there. You want to, if it's a technology agnostic conference, then mm -hmm. you want to make sure you have that all balanced well. Or if you mm -hmm. have different languages, okay, well, what is our audience? Are they primarily .NET? Okay, then we need more .NET. Oh, they're primarily Java? Well, then we need more Java speakers and, and so on. 
the other thing mm -hmm. that content reviewers do prior to the content review is we also help recruit speakers. So we reach okay. out to the communities and say, hey, we need, we would love to see you speak at Momentum. Could you submit topics on blah? Maybe we want more Java people. Then we would reach out to Java communities and the Java champions. Uh, maybe we want to talk to people more about Rust or something else that's going out there. We find those communities and we reach out to them and say, hey, we would love to have more speakers from this community speaking here at our events. Could you please submit? Our CFP is this date. Nice. So uh, not only are you re reviewing the content, you're also kind of representing the, or not representing, but promoting, promoting. The content among speakers Yeah. And get, and get more content there and making That's your own job more difficult. Uh, you know, I would rather make my job more difficult and have more sessions. I would rather have mm. too many sessions than not enough sessions. That's true. So, um, yeah, speaking of, looks like, uh, sounds like this year Momentum's content review was especially hard. And uh, what just would love to hear your thoughts on why do you think that's the case? Um, like, what is it about Momentum? Why are speakers, why are so many speakers excited about speaking at Momentum and submitting so many great talks? Because we've heard that Momentum is just a great conference to speak at. We hear that the organizers take care of the speakers. Um, we hear, heard that it's a just a great community to speak with as well. I mean, I've spoken at Cincinnati in the past at a, a user group long ago. And I remember the community there was just very welcoming and very much eager to learn and eager to share with others. And so knowing that there's a good community there helps. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that these the organizers aren't just organizers. They also speak it in the community. And so we know the quality they put out as themselves. We know the quality they'll stand behind as a conference. So that means that we have to bring our A game. And so that's why you're going to have so many good quality talks being submitted is because people know this is a high caliber community run conference. High caliber conference means we got to bring our A game. No, no slacking off in the department of topics, no slacking off in the department of abstracts. That's great to hear. Also, as like someone who, is, uh, who has just started uh, organizing and investing a lot of my time into this community, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this stuff is definitely great to hear about. After going through the content review, are there any specific proposals that stuck out to you that you think you can talk about? I do have to say, I, so I was laughing as we we're going through the speaker review session because some of the speaker reviewers I've known for years and they're like, Saduki, have you seen these talks? And they would be like, this talk versus this talk. And I'm just dying laughing. I'm like, those both would be awesome. And I'm thinking one of those is mine, but I can't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was happy to see that. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that talk. And I'm excited because it's a talk that I haven't given it any other conference. Wow, first time appearance. It's a, it's a first time appearance. It is scheduled to appear at a couple conferences afterwards, but this is the first conference that has picked it up. Uh, okay. so, uh, so I'm excited about that. It's a talk on using event storming uh, to go from nice. that monolith Mm -hmm. to either microservices or somewhere in between. I don't know if you've seen with the technology in the community nowadays, they're swinging back and forth. People are like, yeah. oh my gosh, microservices, all the things. And other people are like, but we're swinging back to monoliths. And I'm here mm -hmm. going, there's this thing called gray area in the middle too. <laughs> so so my talk will, will, will guide people toward, look at you can come to this gray area. If you want to swing all the way over to microservices, you can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll give you hints on how you get there. Mm -hmm. and why you would want to go there and also the pain points of going there. But I'll also mention that gray area of you can have something in between a monolith and microservices mm -hmm. uh, and event storming. So that's a process where you're talking through the events uh, will really help you to identify those areas a lot better. Nice. Yeah. Are there like any other proposals that you were looking at that caught your eye that you felt like you have to share this with people? <laughs> So I would say AI and ML is going to be hot. Okay. Uh, there's a lot going on in there. Uh, data storytelling is one of the other ones I saw. That's just like, okay. Now those were like top, the areas I saw that I'm like, that would be great to see. I mm -hmm. just, I, 
this uh, I have to say, looking at the the conferences or the conferences, the sessions. So looking at the sessions that we had to work with, mm-hmm. my biggest fear is that I'm not going to be able to choose which session I want to see at a time because they were all that good. Um, I know there was a talk called the power of no. So being able to use okay. the word no, mm-hmm. that one really caught my attention. I don't know if that one got accepted or not. Um, okay. I know they're supposed to be releasing the selections tomorrow, I think I saw. Yeah, we are uh, going to announce that very soon. It, yeah. it's, pro- it's already out by the time this video goes out. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's that. Um, other than that, I there's just so many of them that they were all good that I'm just like, I want to see them all. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I did feel all. like this at KCDC because uh, a lot of, first of all, they had just way too many tracks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like, e- even if there's like two or three talks that I want to that, that I want to see that are happening at the same time, it's sad enough. But what happens if every track has something interesting at some point? Exactly. And, uh, Exactly. Well, and the tough part with something like that is you could go, like, I like to tell people, if you can, go with a group of friends and then Mm -hmm. divide and conquer. If you all are interested in different things, go to the different things and then get together and have lunch and share your findings together. That It's a good thing to do. Um, I know a company I work with, we deal with lunch and learns. And so at conferences, we'll all split up and then we'll get together for a lunch and learn. We'll actually share what did we learn at the conference and what sessions were good and what did we like and what didn't we like. Uh, just to watch out for in future conferences. But yeah, when you get something as large as like KCDC or Stir Track or Codemash or when they have so many tracks that you're like, I want to go to all of them and I don't have enough friends here and I could look at blogs, but it's not the same. Then you're like, hmm, are they recording the sessions? If they're recording the sessions, then all I got to do is figure out which one I want to mm-hmm. see. Yeah. Which, which that kind of helps in a way too, because the advice I tell my friends who come to me on this, because they're like, Saduki, you go to conferences. I'm like, yeah. They're like, how do you choose your sessions? I'm like, <laughs> honestly, for me, I like going to the sessions, but I don't count on the sessions because if they're recorded, I can catch them later. I count on the hallway mm-hmm. track. I count on catching up with people. But mm-hmm. then if I have time to actually go to sessions and I want to whittle it down to what are, who are the speakers that I am least likely to run into at other events or what are topics that I can products and topics that I can use today Mm -hmm. that I need to know about now that I can't wait for a recording for those are Mm -hmm. what I tend to do. And then when they come to me, they're like, Saduki, we wish you could come to your talk. I'm like, if I'm local to you, don't go to my talk (laughs) because you can get me at a user group. You can get me Mm -hmm. at a lunch and learn. You can get me at a whatever kind of gathering. Mm -hmm. For me personally, if I'm local to you, reach out to me afterwards and we'll find a way for me to speak at a place locally. Um, But I would rather find the speakers who are not nearby or not in my usual circles Mm -hmm. and then go and learn from them. Got it. So I feel like the strategy is you're going to miss out on some stuff anyways. Yep. Just find out what, what are the most valuable things at a conference that you need to uh, that you need to know about or the the most unreachable or exactly. most inaccessible people that you need to talk to. Yep. So it sounds like uh, to really make the best experience out of a conference, uh, like the, the attendees should probably like research, do a little bit of like research homework, go through the speaker list, go through the sponsors, uh, sponsor list and figure out which, what do they really want to engage with the most. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And if you have a moment of uh, where you're like, I don't want to go to any of the sessions. If you're sp- if the event has sponsors in the hallway, go talk to the sponsors because that's mm-hmm. something that I don't think people really realize is that it costs a lot to put on an event and our ticket prices are usually not enough to cover the entire event. We have to have sponsors to help offset some of those costs. Mm-hmm. And so there have been times where when I do catch a moment of peace, I will go to the sponsors tables and I will thank them for sponsoring the event and for making it happen because I don't think people realize how important it is that the sponsors know that we care. We appreciate their support. Mm -hmm. And even if it means we talk to them and learn more about them and spend a few minutes doing that, do you realize how much time they're spending with the conference to help make it happen? Yeah. Uh, The representatives at like, they're probably spending the whole day 
yeah. but the people behind the scene the, behind the scenes are probably spending a lot of time as well yep yep so the amount of conferences that you go to these days yeah uh, how many of them are like as a speaker versus or even like as an organizer versus as a regular attendee I haven't been to a conference as a regular attendee in a very long time. Wow. Uh, so most of my conferences, I'm either there as a speaker or as an organizer. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, when I do go into them, I'm going into them just to see, okay, sometimes it's, I hope my talks go well. I, honestly, all the time I hope my talks go well. I hope the demo gremlins don't threaten me. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the time I'm going in, I'm like, okay, who do I want to see? What do I want to accomplish? Uh, right. when, I, when I do go to a conference where I am outside of my usual Avengers, so there's like usually a handful of people that you're like, oh, this person's going to be there and this person's going to be there. And they hang out with these other people. Like mm -hmm. th there's, there's the usual crew. Um, mm -hmm. But I have been to events without my usual crew. And when I go to those, it's because I want to network with other people in the community. I want to meet other communities. And mm -hmm. it's because I want to learn whatever they're they're talking about. So uh, go back in time to 2013 and Strange Loop. So this is the last year for Strange Loop in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was one of those. I was giving a history of women in tech talk. So totally not my usual talks of, of technical stuff. Um, but I went there not knowing who I would go. None of my usual suspects would go there. And it turned out to be one of my favorite conferences because for me, I got to learn about programming languages. I got to learn what people are working on and what might be coming out. I mm -hmm. got to learn about the up, the things that were coming. Um, it was a fabulous community of welcoming com community. I did eventually find two people who I knew from my own community back home who were there, uh, which, was, which was great to find the comforts of home. But at the same time, mm -hmm we all were there because we're programming language folks who this is what we love to deal with. This is what we love to play with and make happen and learn and share with others as well. That's great to hear. Early bird tickets are on sale right now on momentumdefcon.com and make sure you catch them before they go back to regular price. Do you know when they're going back to regular price? Um, keeping the suspense so that oh, people go and dun, buy dun, it as dun. quick as possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the early bird gets the better ticket price. That's mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Uh, but get your tickets today because even though the lineup isn't announced for this video yet, um, what I saw in content review, I can tell you whoever got selected, competition was fierce. It was tough. Uh, and if it was tough for us on the reviewer side, wait until you as the attendee have to decide which sessions you want to go to. A hundred you said it was $149 was the event was the early bird? Yes. Yeah, I mean $149 for this kind of a event is ridiculously priced in the low side. There's so many speakers, best speakers I've seen out there. The topics. There's gonna be something for everybody here. So what are you waiting for? Go get your early bird ticket now before they're gone. Yes, please do that. Uh, you have been involved with conferences for 13, 14 years now, and you had trouble picking up sessions. So yeah, I'm really excited for the level of content this year at Momentum. Yeah, they, they really upped their game this year. It's a, It was a tough field to choose from, but it's going to be awesome. Well, great to hear. Thank you very much, Sarah. Sarah, okay. can I call yeah. you that? Yeah, you can call me Sarah. Sarah Saduki. I have a, a quick story. I was at a conference mm -hmm. once and uh, a bunch of my friends were like, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. I didn't hear a, a single word. Wow. And, one, and then one went, Saduki. And I'm like, yeah, they're like, we've been yelling Sarah for a while. <laughs> like when I'm at tech events, I tend to respond better to Saduki than I do. It's a more unique name. It, so is. it definitely it, sticks out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those that came. So my husband was known as Dookie back when we were kids. It was a nickname he had. And the saws from Sarah, so combined together, uh, wow. was Saduki. And when I got married to him, I took his last name. Mm. And I'm like, hey, can I just take the Saduki nickname? <laughs> got his blessing. And I've been Saduki since. That's amazing. But so, yeah. Awesome. Great backstory behind that interesting name there. Thank you very much for joining me. And, oh, thank you um, for having me. This has been great. Thank oh, you for bearing, bearing with me on the tech tech support issues what a mess 
Yeah, there were some tech support issues before uh, tech issues before we started recording this, but hopefully you guys don't have to worry about that. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, and it was uh, great hearing from you about conferences, and I'm sure there is a lot of uh, valuable, not only just valuable learnings about conference in here, but also some excitement about momentum and not just momentum really, like most conferences in this area in general. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great great community all around. So mm -hmm. awesome! Thank you very much, Thank and you. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around for the next video in which we are going to talk uh, talk to another person who did content review this year from Momentum. So there's no shortage of conference talk here. Awesome! Looking forward to seeing who's next. <laughs>